Amen. Thank you. We're continuing our survey of the Bible, and in particular the Old Testament. There are four groups of books in the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the books of history, the books of poetry, the books of prophecy. We've already examined the first three. We're working our way through the books of prophecy now. As pointed out on several occasions, these 17 books were all written by prophets who lived and prophesied after the time of the divided kingdom. And we've divided them into three groups, the pre-exilic prophets, and those are the prophets who lived and wrote prior to the time of the Babylonian captivity. There were three exilic prophets and three post-exilic prophets. Now thus far, we have worked our way through, almost completely through, the first four. Uh, Joel, memory aid was locusts because a plague of locusts had inundated the southern kingdom and Joel came on the scene as an emissary from God to explain to the folks there that the locusts had inundated the land because of their sinful behavior. God wanted them to know why this plague had destroyed their land and he promised that worse things would come if they didn't clean up their act. Jonah was the second one and we're doing these in chronological order. Uh, the memory ate his fish because he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish because he wouldn't go to Nineveh and preach. He decided then after the fish ordeal that he would. And the third prophet that we've talked, we talked about was Amos, a herdsman from Tekoa who was sent to the northern kingdom. That in itself was sort of unusual uh, to preach against the social injustice. And the fourth prophet, the prophet we began working our way through last week, is Hosea. Memory aid there is prostitute because God told Hosea to marry a prostitute. He wanted Hosea to be a living sermon. God had married a prostitute called Israel, and God called Israel a prostitute because she was unfaithful to God in that she worshipped foreign gods, idols, gods that didn't exist. God considered that adultery or prostitution. And so God told Hosea he wanted him to marry a prostitute so he could be a living sermon. These four prophets, Amos and Hosea in the north, Micah and Isaiah in the south, lived and wrote during the 8th century B.C. That's from 800 B.C. to 700 B.C. This was a time of great prosperity in both the northern and southern kingdoms. And with that, pro that great prosperity, there was moral depravity. And God was disgusted by that, which is why he raised up Amos and Hosea in the north and Micah and Isaiah in the south. And these men had complementary messages. Amos spoke out against uh, social injustice. That is, he rebuked them for their sins against men. Hosea rebuked them for their sins against God, focusing on idolatry. In the south, Micah rebuked the folks in the southern kingdom for their sins against men. Isaiah rebuked them for their sins against God. Now, as pointed out, we began uh, our study of Hosea last week, and Lord willing, we'll wrap that up this evening. A brief preview, a review, <laughs> a review. How's that? I'll get my syllables right. Brief review, because we started last week, and I want to pick up and finish Hosea, but it requires sort of going back over some material. God commanded Hosea to marry a harlot named Gomer. Hosea was, as I pointed out a moment ago, a living sermon. God liked to illustrate points, and this poor man was called on to illustrate a point, but he loved her, just as God loved Israel. But it was a heartbreak, because his wife was out praying the role of a prostitute had to break his heart. But then when Israel worshipped other gods, it broke his heart. And that's what God wanted them to see and wants us to see. He's not insensitive to this sort of thing. He was a living servant. God married Israel, and Israel was a prostitute. Hosea married Gomer, and Gomer was a prostitute. After going home with Hosea, which was a good deal for her, she didn't have to live on the streets. It was really a party life. It was more than just prostitution. She liked the nightlife, the, the music, the drinking, the dancing, the, the, the sex. She just wanted the party life, which is not unusual. There's lots of folks today who like that. Anyway, she was, it was a good deal. She went home with Hosea, but she, couldn't, she just couldn't stay away from her party life, her nightlife. So she 
apparently was still uh, going out with other men, even while she was living at home with Hosea. But after a while, she just wanted to stay away from Hosea and uh, indulge herself. And with the hard life of drinking and dancing and music and partying, uh, she fell on hard times. And people who get involved in that life often do fall on hard times. In fact, it got so bad she was uh, put on the block to be sold as a slave. Apparently she borrowed money, got into debt, and that's often how you paid off your debt in antiquity. God told Hosea to buy her back. And uh, this was to illustrate Christ's purchase, uh, purchase of, of Israel at Calvary. He did buy her back, just as Christ brought Israel back from the slave market of sin and death at Calvary. Hosea took her home, but was not intimate with her for a season. This was to illustrate God's present relationship with Israel. God bought Israel back from the slave market of sin at Calvary's cross, but has not yet reestablished the intimacy with her that he had prior. Keep in mind, for 1,500 years, from the time of the, of the, 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 the exodus from Egypt, God had an incredibly intimate relationship with Israel. In fact, more intimate with Israel than any nation on the planet. And the, uh, when they were in the wilderness, he dwelt in the middle of their camp. Uh, he dwelt between the two golden cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant, and that was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the, city, was the center of the camp with all the tribes camped around them. Later on, when they built the temple in Jerusalem, God dwelt in the temple. So he was very intimate in that his presence on earth was right in the center of their community. And God wanted to illustrate that with Hosea and Gomer. They had an intimate relationship, but when... She left and was sold at the slave market and bought back from Hose, by Hosea. He brought her home and says, we will not be intimate for a while. That illustrates what happened between God and Israel. At Calvary, God brought is, bought Israel back to the slave market of sin. But they have not yet, for the last 2,000 years, reestablished the intimate relationship they had in the previous 1,500 years. They will one day, and we're going to be talking about that. And because God is going to talk later on in Hosea about restoring that intimate relationship. But right now, that hasn't taken place. They were intimate, sold into slavery, bought back, but not intimate yet. Not intimate yet. Illustrates their present relationship. And uh, I tried to outline things for you and then go to the scriptures so you can see the support. Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. A uh, homer is about eight bushels. A, a lethic is a half of homer, or about four bushels. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute. And she couldn't now because she was, in fact, a slave owned by her. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. The, intimate, the implication here is with this, this sentence structure is that she wasn't intimate with him either, with any man. For the Israelites, God's continuing here, will live many days without king or prince without sacrifice or sacred stones. That's the situation for them right now. They are living many days without a king. There's no king in Israel. There's no prince in Israel. There's no sacrifice or sacred stones in Israel. Why? Because in 70 AD, when the, when the Roman general Titus conquered Jerusalem, he destroyed the temple, and there have not been any sacrifices since, because the only place that the Jews can offer up sacrifices is in the temple in Jerusalem, and that no longer exists and hasn't existed in 70 A.D. So when God was saying here for the Israelites, we'll live many day without, days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol, he's talking about today, many days, 2,000 years thus far, and it's still going on. Afterwards, the Israelites will turn and seek the Lord their God and David their king. After this period of time that we're in right now, Israel is going to return. Seek God and David their king, and he's talking about the Messiah. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. We'll be talking more about this in a moment. There are, that's a very brief summary of the, the chapters in which Hosea had his relationship with Gomer. Now, there are a number of passages in the book of Hosea that I want to spend some time on. 
as I pointed out, this is a survey course. In a survey course, you try to give folks a sense of what the whole book is, but then there are a handful of passages that you need to sort of get a handle on, you need to focus on. If we go to Isaiah, how can you imagine, can, could you possibly imagine uh, doing a survey of Isaiah and leaving out Isaiah 53? That would be criminal, criminal. And for those of you who know Isaiah 53, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So there are a handful of passages, only a handful. There are a lot of passages that we'll overlook, but there's some you need to know about. And there are three passages in Hosea that I think we need to spend a little time on. One is in Hosea chapter 2, where we're told that God provided for Israel while she was rebelling. The point here is that God is telling us what a heartbreak it is to supply the one you love with the very materials they need to rebel against you. God gave Israel the gold and silver that they needed to build the idols of Baal. And God supplied them with the animals and the grain and the oil that they used as sacrifices to Baal. And guess who God gave, the Israelites gave credit for all their prosperity during this incredibly prosperous time? Baal! They took the prosperity God gave them and used it as a weapon against God. We do the same thing, folks. We have a country that is sticking its fist in God's face a country that's filled with colleges and universities that cost billions and billions of dollars. And those colleges and universities are spitting in the face of God. And yet they're filled with men and women who are given the intellectual capacity to spit in the face of God. We're doing the same thing. And it's disgusting. And God wants us to see that it's disgusting, which is why he tells us about this. And then the second passage we're going to spend a little time on is Uh, also in the second chapter, and that is that God will lead Israel into the desert to restore her. One day God is going to restore Israel. We read about that just a moment ago. He's going to do it in a desert. And this, oddly enough, is mentioned in Hosea, but it's mentioned in a bunch of other books. So we're going to spend a little time on that. You need to know about it. And then there's this interesting little throwaway passage in chapter 6. I say throwaway because they sort of hit at something we don't want to be too dogmatic about, but God says, after two days, the Israelites talking here, after two days, God will restore Israel. So we'll spend a little time on that, not much time. All right, God provided for Israel while she was rebelling. Let's read about it. She, Israel, said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, my drink. My lovers are false gods. She, Israel, has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold they used for Baal. This is really kind of disgusting, isn't it? God gave the Israelites what they needed to be idolatrous. When we exercise our wickedness, we do so with the time and energy and materials supplied by God. Israel built idols, they should have built, built, You can see I wasn't together when I wrote this. With the gold, and my wife edits the notes. She doesn't edit the PowerPoint, so don't blame her for the power. (laughs) Israel built, not build, built idols with gold and silver supplied by God. Israel offered sacrifices to their idols with animals and grain supplied by God. Israel gave Baal credit for her prosperity. And God found that offensive. And why shouldn't he find that offensive? Now, This situation probably played itself out in in the lives of Hosea and Gomer, though we're not told that specifically in the text. In the text, we're told specifically that God was offended when Israel attributed the prosperity he had given the nation to Baal. He was offended they took the gold and silver he gave them to build idols of Baal. God was offended that he, they took the materials like the grain and the animals and the wine and offered them as sacrifices. But he was offended by that. And we're told specifically about that, but we're not told specifically that God asked Hose, uh, Ho, that that same sort of situation existed between Hosea and Gomer. Most scholars, however, believe that it did. In fact, uh, James Montgomery Boyce has, writes two or three pages on it in his commentary on Hosea, which is beautiful. If you have his commentary, read it when you go home. It's wonderful. But I, we assume that probably 
this did play out because the book of Hosea was designed to show us the parallels between God's marriage to Israel and Hosea's marriage to Gomer. So the assumption is that when God wrote about uh, him supplying himself supplying is, uh, materials to Israel that they used to rebel against him to worship their idols, that in fact the same sort of thing, same thing existed in Hosea's relationship with Gomer. That being the case, imagine it going something like this. Gomer has left. She's gone back to the party life, the night life. She doesn't need to sell herself because she's uh, doing okay for a while, and she's got a boyfriend. But she falls on hard times. This is the same town, incidentally, in which Hosea lived. Hosea hears about it. This is before he buys her back from the slave market. This was step one. Step two is buying her back from the slave market where she was being sold as a slave. He hears that things are going tough for her. And so he loads up a wagon with grain and oil and wine and a little gold and a little silver and takes it to her home. She isn't there, but her boyfriend's there. And uh, Hosea, I'm sure the boyfriend knew about Hosea. You're talking small town, so everybody knows everybody. And he probably thought Hosea was a fool. But Hosea says, I understand things are bad, so I bought some food, some grain, some oil, some wine, and a little gold and silver. And uh, the boyfriend thanks him for it and thinks, what a jerk. That's the way we would think. And Hosea leaves. And Gomer comes home. And here's things are tough. Have been first. The reason Hosea was there was because they, he heard things were tough. They didn't have enough money to eat. They didn't have money for rent. Now suddenly she sees oil and grain and wine and gold and silver. And she's thrilled. And she says, if we're going to parallel, where did all this come from? And the boyfriend says, well, you know that business deal I was talking to you about, about the other day? It came through. And she says, oh, you're so wonderful. I just love you. This is the parallel. In fact, why don't we take some of this money and put you in a new set of clothes? I want my guy looking good. That's the parallel. You found that disgusting? Of course you do. Well, that's exactly how God found Israel's conduct with Baal disgusting. Because it was disgusting. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water and my wool and my linen my oil and my drink. Gomer believed that her boyfriend supplied this stuff. She, Israel, has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain and the wine and oil and lavished on her the silver and gold which they used for Baal. James Boyce wrote, Does God really act like this? Does he love us and provide for us even while we're running away? The answer in this story and indeed in the entire Bible is that he does. We spurn his love and squander his resources, but still he loves us and provides for us. He's providing all that the men and women need to live on throughout the world, the men and women who are spitting in his face and worshiping false gods. He's supplying all of that because he loves us. He doesn't have to. There's no, there's no universal rule that God is obligated to take care of rebels. We sometimes think that there is some sort of universal rule. There is not. We do the same sort of thing in this country. We're doing the same sort of thing in our own country when we take the intellectual wealth God has given us and use it to open colleges and universities that major in denouncing God as the creator and sustainer of the universe. We do that. Look at those colleges and universities. They are packed with powerhouse brains. They are. A lot of very bright men and women there. And you know who molded those bright brains? God did. Read David. He molded me while I was in my mother's womb. So God gives them the intellectual power that they need to create colleges and universities and universities and an intellectual environment that de denies the very existence of God. In fact, evolution denies the existence of God. God says in Romans 1 that the greatest tangible or visible evidence of his existence is creation. The other reasons to believe in the existence of God, but the, he says that the greatest reason for believing in the existence of God is creation, and we 
university system that he's allowed to exist and supplied the brain power for that says it's all a big accident. Can you imagine the brilliance of his creation is written off by us with the brain power he gives us as an accident? The brilliance of his creation is written off. It's just, it just sort of happened. Dumb. Okay, passages in Hosea that deserve our attention. The first one was in chapter 2, where we're told that God provided for Israel while she was rebelling. The second one is also in chapter 2, where we read about God leading Israel into the desert to restore her. We read about it, Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 through. I have it 20 in your notes. There was an error there. That should be 23 on page 1046, so if you want to correct your notes. We read this. Therefore, I'm going to allure her. This is God talking about Israel. And the language here is the language of a husband to his wife, the language of love, the language of romance. I'm going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards. It will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. The valley of Achor was the valley in which Achan was stoned. Remember Achan, when the children of Israel uh, first came into the land of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua, the first city they attacked and destroyed was Jericho. And the rule that came down from on high was that all the spoils that you get from Jericho are to go to the Lord. Other cities, you get to keep it. But in Jericho, you have to give it to the Lord. Well, Achan was the guy who, along with his family, decided to take some of it for themselves. Remember, they buried it under their tent. And they were found out, and they were taken to the Valley of Achor and stoned to death. So the Valley of Achor is a place of judgment and pain and sorrow. And what God is saying here, that I will give her back her vineyards, it will make the Valley of Achor a door of hope, that which was judgment and, 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 and grief, a, valley, a place of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came out of Egypt. And that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. God is delighted in this. I re re will remove the names of Baals from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. And that day I will make a covenant with them, uh, with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creatures that move along the ground, bow and sword and battle I will abolish in the land so that I'll, all may lie down in safety. So what is this period of time he's talking about? Thank you. Now the point I'm trying to make is that what God is telling us is the time in which I'm going to allure her into the desert and restore her is going to be during the time of the millennium and the tribulation in the last days. He doesn't say millennium, doesn't say tribulation, so you have to look at the description of the period of time to know what period of time God is talking about. I will remove the names of Baal from the When is that going to take place? During the tribulation and the millennium. I will make a covenant with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air. That is, I will lift the curse God placed on the planet. And a bow and sword and battle I will abolish in the land. Men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And men will learn war no more, and they will lie down in safety. Continuing, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I call not my loved one, Lo Ruhama. And I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Now, to fully understand this, we have to go back to last week's lecture. We pointed out that... Uh, Hosea and Gomer were a living sermon on the relationship God had with Israel, but they had three children, remember? The first one was named Jeo, Je Jezreel, which means to scatter, and the second one was a, a, a daughter named Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved, and then the third one was another son named Lo Ami, which means not my people. And the reason God had Hosea named the, her, his three children, get, the reason God gave those names to Hosea for his children because he was trying to give them names that would express his future plans for Israel. His future plans were to scatter them and to make it appear as though they were not loved and as though they were not his people because when they're scattered, and that's true for the last 2,000 years, it probably seemed as though God didn't love them. It might have seemed like God 
rejected them as his people. What he's saying here in this passage is, uh, I'm going to reverse that. I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I call not my love. Well, I'm going to show my love to her. I will say to those called not my people, lo and me, you are my people. They will say, you are my God. And now all of this is going to be fulfilled during the tribulation and the millennium. And I want to run through the details of this, but just give you a brief overview. This whole package of events, when God is going to allure Israel into the desert, where he is going to speak tenderly to her and judge her, is going to take place during the second half of the tribulation period. And uh, but how do you get all of Israel out into the desert? You can get all of Israel out into the desert because during the second half of the tribulation there's going to be tremendous persecution against the Jews and the only place they're going to find safety is in modern day Jordan, which is in the ancient country of Edom, Moab, and Edom. Now, in the scriptures, when God tells us the desert he's going to take them to, he doesn't say, I'm going to take them to the desert of Jordan. Why? Jordan didn't exist. But he gives us the ancient names that were one day, uh, ancient names of countries that one day made up modern day Jordan. That's how we know they're going to go out to Jordan. Now, very briefly, at midpoint in the tribulation, there's going to be a battle, big battle in heaven. Michael and his angels are going to fight against Satan and his angels. And uh, as you, I'm sure, are aware, uh, Michael and his angels will win. And Satan's going to be tossed out, to which you say, but I thought he was tossed out when he sinned. He was tossed out of his favorable position in heaven when he sinned many years ago, when he led that rebellion. And along with that rebellion, a third of the angels fell with him. He lost his favorable position, but he still has access to heaven. Remember Job? Satan and his angels had access to God. So, but at midpoint, he won't have any more access. He's going to be tossed out of heaven. There's only three and a half years left of the tribulation period and the scriptures tell us that he knows his time is short and he's going to devote his time to trying to kill Jews. At the same time, midpoint in the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to break his treaty with Israel. Remember, the, the tribulation starts with the Antichrist signing a peace treaty with Israel. And so the implication is that for three, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, Israel has a good relationship. In fact, they probably are able to rebuild the temple during that three and a half years. We know it will be up during those three and a half years because at midpoint he's going to stop sacrifices there. So it could, have, it could possibly be built before the tribulation. It will be certainly built. If not, it will be built during the tribulation. The Antichrist is going to go into the temple in Jerusalem, put a stop to sacrifices, have an image of himself built, and the false prophet is going to be allowed to give it breath, and he's going to say, you worship me in my image or you die. So now we've got Satan coming down from heaven, going after the Jews. You've got the Antichrist, and the Jews, incidentally, at this point, are not going to buy this. They've been rebelling against God, but they're not going to buy the Antichrist as their Messiah. He's going to declare himself to be God. They're going to say, no, you're not. He's going to say, then you're dead. So we've got Antichrist and false prophet, uh, Satan and the Antichrist trying to the Jews. And the only place they're going to find safety is in modern-day Jordan the ancient Moab, Ammon, and, and Mo, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. <laughs> okay, so that's how God's going to get Israel into the desert. Because if they don't go to the desert, they're killed. That's how he's going to get them all out in the desert. And there he's going to judge them, and he's going to judge those who are deliberately and ferociously rebellious, but a third of the Jews are going to turn to him and worship him and finally recognize Jehovah is their husband and never turn away. So this is a quick summary. Let's go through it now. God will lead Israel into the desert and restore her. Satan will get tossed out of heaven at midpoint of the tribulation. Let me read a portion of it. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth and his angels with him. 
Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He's only got three and a half years before the end of the tribulation. He's going to get cast into the abyss, awaiting the final judgment. When Satan saw that he had been hurled to earth, he pursued the woman. That's Israel who had given birth to the male child. That's Jesus. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the... That this desert's going to come up a lot in a bunch of passages where she might be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. And out of the serpent's reach. So, midpoint of the tribulation, Satan will get tossed out of heaven and he's going to come to earth and pursue the woman, Israel, and try to destroy her. But the woman's going to be given wings so she can fly into the desert. Now, you have to put a bunch of different passages together to get the whole story. We're not told at this point that the desert is the desert of, of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, but other passages we are told that. So when we're told she's going to the desert, we know from other passages what desert it will be. The Antichrist will present himself to the Jews as their Messiah. 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day, that's the end days, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that's called God or is worshipped. So he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. He does that at midpoint, first three in the tribulation. First three and a half years, he's got a good relationship with Israel. That's how he, one of the reasons he became world leader. But midpoint, He's going to proclaim himself to be God and demand to be worshipped. Daniel wrote, He, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That's the beginning of the tribulation. In the middle of the seven, that's how I know it's midpoint of the tribulation, he will put an end to sacrifices and offering. That's how we know there's a temple. Because there's only one place they can be. there can be sacrifices and offerings. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. And that's going to be an image of him, and the false prophet will give breath to it. And we're told in other passages that you have to worship or you die. Until the end, that is decreed, is poured out on him. So, midpoint of the tribulation, Satan gets tossed out of heaven. The Antichrist presents himself to the Jews as the Messiah. And the Antichrist will go to war against the Jews. And the reason he's going to go, against the war, go to war against the Jews is because, first of all, he's Satan's man, so he would do that anyway. But the second reason is because Jews will not buy the Antichrist. If there's ever going to be a turning point in Jewish thinking, it's going to be at midpoint in the tribulation. They will have made a treaty with this guy. At midpoint, they're going to realize that was a big mistake. That was a big mistake. And... He's going to be coming after them to kill them if they don't worship him in that image. And that's when they're given wings to fly to the desert, a place prepared for them where God will protect them. And they're going to know it's God who's protecting them, so they're finally going to come to their senses. They are going to finally get a heart that embraces God. Let's read it. The false prophet ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. That's another story. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all refu who refused to worship the image to be killed. That's the reason Jews have to leave. Jesus talked, spoke about this moment, and this is where he's going to tell the Jews to get out of Jerusalem. This is the Olivet Discourse. So, Jesus talking. When you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, Spoken of through the prophet Daniel, we just read that passage. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Judea, he's talking to whom? Jews. You better flee, folks. For then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. The greatest period of distress in the history of the world, never to be equaled again. This is the second half of the seven-year tribulation. So, Midpoint, Satan gets tossed out of heaven. The Antichrist presents himself to the Jews as their Messiah. The Antichrist will go to war against the Jews. God will protect the Jews in the desert of Jordan, deserts of Jordan. And this is where Ammon, Moab, and Edom are located. Edom is south of the Dead Sea. Moab is uh, southeast. And Ammon is northeast. This are the three ancient countries that make up modern-day Jordan. And we know from other scripture that this is where God is going to protect them. Revelation 12, 6. 
the woman that is Israel fled into the desert, a place prepared for her by God. God's going to make sure. He's preparing a place for her in Jordan to, to take care of her and protect her, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. That's three and a half years. That's the second half of the tribulation. Daniel 11. He, the Antichrist, will also invade the beautiful land. That's when he goes to Israel to set himself up as God in the, Messiah, uh, in, in the temple. Many countries will fall. But Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered. In short, the Antichrist is not going to be able to touch the folks there. So, midpoint, Satan gets tossed out. Antichrist presents himself as the Jewish Messiah. The Antichrist goes to war against the Jews. God will protect the Jews in the desert of Jordan. And God will restore Israel to himself in this desert. Therefore, and now back to Hosea. We did a long way around to get back to Hosea. But now you know the desert we're talking about and what led to this. Therefore, I'm going to allure her. This is the language of romance. This is God loving Israel, folks. Therefore, I'm going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. And that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. Now we know how he lured her into the desert. How he lured her into the desert? Because he kicked Satan out of heaven. The Antichrist declared himself to be God. And he says, you worship me or you die. And, he, and these are now Jews all over the world. So guess how God allured them into the desert? He used the Antichrist and Satan to allure her into the desert where he's going to speak tenderly to her and where he will restore to her the relationship they should have had all along. God will speak tenderly to Israel, and he will also purge those who are determined to be rebellious. So two things are going to happen. He's going to speak tenderly to Israel, but there are still going to be those who have a fist in the face of God. And that's about two-thirds. But a third are going to turn and embrace him and never look back. Now we have to go to Ezekiel to find out about this. I warned you, you have to go all over the Bible to get these pieces. Ezekiel 20, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will rule over you, that is Israel, with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered. That's starting to take place today, but at midpoint in the tribulation, it's going to pick up, pick up steam because there's going to be one place on this planet where Jews are going to be protected. And where is that? Modern-day Jordan, I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered. That's, that took place in 70 A.D. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you into, there's that desert again. I will bring you into the desert of the nations and there face to face I will execute judgment upon you. As I judge your fathers in the desert of the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the sovereign Lord. I, I will take note of you as you pass under my rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge you of those who revolt and rebel against me, because not everyone's going to turn to him, but because some are going to revolt and rebel, and he says, I'm going to purge you of, of Israel of those. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So there's going to be a purging and a tender marriage. Zechariah wrote, <laughs> In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish. Those are the rebels. Yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. This is the purging. He's going to take him out into the desert of Jordan, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. And there he's going to protect them. And there is where he's going to finally purge them of those who insist on being rebellious. But two-thirds, two-thirds, who will come through this fire of the purging, will be refined and go into the lineum with the Lord Jesus Christ as his people and rule the world with him. So, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say to them, they are my people. And they will say... The Lord is our God. Praise God for that third. So, Satan just tossed out. Antichrist presents himself as the Jewish Messiah. The Antichrist will go to war against the Jews. God will protect the Jews in the desert of Jordan. And God will restore Israel to himself in this desert period. 
Okay, so we've looked at the first two passages of Scripture I wanted to take note of. Let's, uh, first, God provided for Israel while she was rebelling. Secondly, God will lead Israel into the desert and restore her. And the third is a little throwaway. By that I mean this passage hints at something, but don't get too dogmatic. You know, there are lots of scriptures in the Bible you can get dogmatic about. You get dogmatic about only one God, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That die for. Uh, you, there are lots of things that you know how to get dogmatic on. You, you die for these things. This little passage is interesting, uh, but I wouldn't get too dogmatic about it. I think it's, but I want to share it with you because I've always been sort of fascinated by it. This passage is this. Hosea 6. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. Well, think of the last 2,000 years they've been torn to pieces. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Now, hold this idea, and let's go down to Peter. 2 Peter 3. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now, let's take this Peter business about a day and a thousand years and transfer it up here to Hosea. So this is not great exegesis, but it's a hint. But you don't want to ignore it. You don't, it's not, you don't want to get dogmatic about it, but you want to ignore it. After two days, or think after 2,000 years, right? 1,000 years is a day. After 2,000 days, he will revive us. Well, the last 2,000 years, Israel has been defeated and scattered. But we're looking for the Lord to become, right? And Israel being what? Revived. Isn't that going to happen during the tribulation? Unless, of course, the tribulation doesn't come for another thousand years in which this whole package I'm presenting to you completely falls apart. After two days, he will revive us. After 2,000 years. 2,000 years. On the third day, think the third thousand years is the millennial reign, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Now, I put it on a timeline because I like timelines, as you know. The ancient rabbis believed that the seven days of creation represented seven, 1,000 years in Earth's history. And uh, it's not a bad idea, actually. They're pretty sharp guys, those ancient rabbis. And uh, if you use the Bible as a chronological tool, Adam was created roughly 4,000 B.C. Jesus came to earth about 4,000 years after Adam and Eve. And uh, the Jews were conquered by the Romans and dispersed around the world. They've been torn to pieces for the last 2,000 years, right? Or the fifth and sixth day. The Lord Jesus Christ returns at the end of the tribulation and the seventh day or seventh 1,000 year year period in earth's history will be a time of peace so let, come let us return to the lord he has torn us to pieces but he will heal us he has injured us but he will bind up our wounds after two days after two thousand years he will revive us they will definitely be revived in the millennial reign of christ on the third day the millennial reign he will restore us that we may live in his presence I say it a little throwaway because you don't want to get too dogmatic about it. But it's very interesting, isn't it? And you don't want to go through Hosea without that little piece of interesting information. With that, we'll close. <laughs> I don't know how many of you I've convinced. I hope not too seriously. There are passages of Scripture that hint at ideas. Don't ignore them. They enrich our understanding of the Word of God. At the same time, you don't get super dogmatic at passages of Scripture that hint at ideas. To come up with strong doctrines, you need lots of Scripture that's clear, and it's not full of a lot of symbolism. Otherwise, if you're not careful, you'll fill your head with garbage. And there's enough garbage in our heads already. Just living in the 21st century fills our heads with garbage. So I would urge you not to fill your, help, your heads with garbage. But at the same time, don't ignore passages like this that hint at something very interesting. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being our God and loving us. What a glorious, wonderful God you are. Thank you for revealing all this to us. And it's so good to know that in spite of Israel's disobedience, 
You never forgot them. You never gave up on the covenant you made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of that, we know you will never give up on us. You made covenants to us. Those of us who place our faith in Christ are, we're told by you, secure for eternity. And we love that. Thank you. We're eager for you to come, Lord Jesus. And, uh, and that third day, revive Israel and uh, us along with it and with them. I pray you'll give us all a good week. Bring us back safely next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.